Hello class and welcome to week three. Um, today we're going to jump in and talk about access controls, standards of best practice for security, uh, business continuity planning, and general controls like firewalls and IPS. So there are three major types of access controls. There's mandatory, discretionary, and rule-based. Mandatory access control, or MAC, Allow, or requires that administrators tag data and users. Uh, in the next slide, we're going to take a look at a graphic and uh, that'll show this in more detail. But simply, if a if a user and the data don't have similar tags, then the user cannot access the data. So, for example, if the data is top secret and the user only has a secret clearance. The user is blocked from the data. Now, a common misconception in the classes that I, t that I facilitate is that if you have a top secret clearance and the data is top secret, <clears throat> excuse me, you can access any top secret data. This is not true. We still have to, to enforce need to know, least privilege, and separation of duties. If a user has a top secret clearance, they're only going to get access to the top secret information necessary to perform their tasks. Discretionary access control is what comes with Active Directory out of the box. Users or administrators can set and manage security on a user-by-user -user basis. This is problematic and it can get very complex, and complexity is the enemy of security. That's one concept you must remember, you need to take out of this class, is that con complexity is the enemy of security. With discretionary access controls and user-by-user -user security management, you can end up with a thousand users that are individually managed for access, and permissions creep, which means that as their jobs change uh, or as temporary rights and permissions are given to users, the old rights and permissions or the temps are not taken away from them and over time they just keep aggregating more and more rights and permissions to the network and to the connected resources. Discretionary access control is okay for very small businesses, you know, five to ten users, where it's easy to manage their access and to stay on top of who can do what to, to uh, your data. Role-based access control is a very straightforward approach. It uses the user's role in the organization to provide access. And we're going to get into a, a, I don't want to spend a lot of time out on it on this slide because uh, there's a graphic and a couple slides where uh, we're going to go into more detail. But essentially, when an employee is hired, you drop them into a role and they automatically have the access and only the access they need to perform their jobs. Role-based access control is what most businesses should be using. Mandatory access control is very complex and can be uh, can cost a lot to manage. Mandatory access control you're going to find it mostly in uh, government, where there's highly sensitive data, national defense secrets, if you will, that need to be protected, or contractors who also deal with that data. So mandatory access control. As you can see here, user A has secret clearance, can't get to the top secret data. User B has top secret clearance, and they can get to the top secret data. However, remember that we still need to enforce need to know, least privilege, and separation of duties. I like to think of MAC as something that's added on top of role based access control, it's an additional check so that if a user B is dropped into a role uh, and all of it and and they don't have the right clearances then they're not going to be able to access the data so for example let's say user A gets dropped into the role that user B is in currently user A would not be able to would not be able to 
access any top secret information. So if an administrator made a mistake, no data compromise will occur. The user will not be able to look at information he or she is not supposed to be looking at. Our role-based access control. So in, our, in this example, we, have, we start with the data owner. A data owner is a senior manager, usually a, a vice president, department head, who is responsible for the information or for a set of the information a business is managing. The data owner appoints role managers. These role managers determine what roles need access to what data and also determine what those roles have need to be able to do with that data so that the department or the the facility employees can do their jobs. The role managers submit their recommendations to the data owner. The data owner approves them and this creates a set of role access definitions. The role access definitions are implemented by security into a into an RBOC solution. Now Active Directory can emulate role-based access control but it's not a true role-based access solution unless you add additional product to it. Uh, a true RBOC solution will actually go out and in in addition to creating a Active Directory account it'll create accounts in all applications for which a connector exists. So let's talk about the provisioning process. First you have an authoritative source. An authoritative source is usually something like your human resources application. It provides terminations to the provisioning process so that it can be can deprovision user accounts. It provides new users so that those users can be provisioned. And it also provides role information. So HR places a user into the authoritative source. A feed is provided to the provisioning process. The provisioning process looks at each new employee or each termination, goes over to the role access definitions, and says, okay, this user a new user belongs in this role, so based on that role definition, I need to provision an account for the intranet, provision an account in Active Directory, and provision an account in the financial application. The terminated employee, again, provisioning process checks the role access definitions to find out what role that user was in, and based on the role definitions, disables the accounts on all applications including Active Directory that that, at, that that role that user in that role had access to. So this is an automated process to provide onboarding which is called onboarding is a term used for automatic creating of the accounts and deprovisioning. It's great for terminations because you had you don't have to worry so much about getting caught in an audit because you didn't disable somebody's account after they were terminated. Standards of best practice are sets of standards and guidelines that companies can implement within within their networks or within their security practice and if a company is following a standard of best practice it shows due diligence and it prevents gaps from occurring in the security controls framework. The first one here is COBIT. COBIT is um, what financial auditors would you, will use if they come in and do a SOX audit on your organization. COBIT is not as complete as the uh, ISO 27002, 
because it's concerned primarily with financial information. COBIT-5 has been released. It's more, a little bit more comprehensive, but it's really a combination of COBIT and ISO 27002 or the ITIL security uh, framework together that provide the best protection for your business. The ISO 27002 is an international standard. Uh, it's the one that uh, HIPAA and FISMA are related closest to. And if, you're, if you use ISO 27002, there's a very good chance that you'll be COBIT compliant. There's a very good chance that you will be HIPAA compliant and FISMA compliant. The ITIL Information Technology Infrastructure Library is a complete library of change management, of uh, security, of um, information assurance, all types of approaches to keeping your information safe, keeping it available, and maintaining its accuracy. And then my favorite reference for just about everything is NIST CSRC. The National Institute of Standards and Technology has a whole set of publications which are modified on a regular basis that go into detail on many best practice issues to help you to properly design your security both on the network and in applications. So the first control we're going to talk about are firewalls. The best way to set up a firewall is to block everything and then open only the port IP address pairs that you need to conduct business. A firewall can sit at the perimeter or it can be set as a gateway to a network segment. So a network segment, for example, might have a firewall that has an integrated intrusion prevention system and so only the data that is required to go into that network segment will be allowed through and any anonym anomalous traffic will be blocked. It's important to keep the firewall operating systems up to date. For example, in a Cisco device, the iOS needs to be kept patched and it needs to be kept and upgrades need to be reviewed to, inch, to uh, implement them as quickly as you can as, as time and, and capabilities allow. Because even within firewalls, vulnerabilities occur. There is no such thing as vulnerability-free software. And a firewall, after all, is controlled by an operating system. So it's very important to keep them up to date. And there are two types of firewalls. We have network firewalls, like the one we just talked about, where you put it on the perimeter or you put it as a gateway into a network segment. And there's also endpoint firewalls. For example, Windows comes with a firewall. Windows 7, uh, Windows 8 will be coming with a firewall. XP got a firewall um, late in its implementation. And the host space firewall the endpoint firewall is your last wall of defense and it helps to prevent bad things from hitting your machine. Remember we talked about worms. It can help uh, worms from scanning and getting onto your system. What a firewall won't do is prevent a user from bringing, bringing bad stuff down and installing it on their endpoint, whether it's a server or whether it's a uh, desktop, laptop, etc. So a firewall prevents bad things from automatically coming down. The other thing a firewall can do if it goes in both directions. In other words, the Windows 7 firewall prevents things from coming in, uh, but it does not prevent things from going out necessarily. So what's necessary is to make sure that your firewalls are configured so that they block all traffic going out except that traffic required for the system to do business or for the system to access applications or run applications 
and uh, access network resources necessary for business operation. This can be a problem in some organizations if the firewalls are not properly configured upon uh, upon implement or um, initialization of the system and before it's given to the user because what the user will end up with is a bunch of messages saying hey you needed you know do you really want to do this so it's important that if you're going to block outgoing traffic that you have a, a way to centrally update firewall configurations so that if you put in a new solution that the, uh, the users are going to be able to access it. Intrusion prevention systems and intrusion detection systems. The first thing I want to talk about is a button. Uh, in the reading they talk about IPDS. IPDS is something that the author came up with. It is not a, a standard description for IPS IDS devices. The reason for that is because an intrusion prevention system, by definition, can also act as an intrusion detection system. An IDS cannot. So you get both in an IPS. You don't have to call it IPDS. And if you do that, and when you're in meetings with vendors and security people, uh, they may look at you a little funny. So we need to get out of the habit. I need you to get out of the habit of using that before you go on to classes if you're going to go on to classes like CMGT 430 Enterprise Security. Uh, students I have in that class, I just, it, I, it's very, one of the first things I have to do is break that habit for them. So, Intrusion Prevention System detects anomalous packets and network behavior. Um, it's an appliance. It, again, there's two types. There's a network IPS and an endpoint IPS or host-based IPS. The network IPS usually sits on the perimeter, usually sits behind a firewall. You don't want to put it in front of the firewall because it's just going to get overloaded. IPSs can only handle a certain amount of traffic. That's why when you buy an IPS, you have to buy one that you know is going to handle the traffic that you want to throw through it. The uh, inspection engine in an IPS can get bogged down very quickly and it it becomes a self-imposed denial of service attack. It's also a way an attacker could launch an, a denial of service is by overloading your IPS. The IPS alerts or blocks traffic based on rules that you define. And these rules are created during a tuning process. IPS must be tuned. Because when you first put it in, it's either going to block it's either going to block too much or it's not going to block enough. Most IPS devices, because they're placed in line with traffic, in other words, traffic must flow through the IPS. It isn't just mirrored to it. It flows through it. The IPS is a gateway. It's a it's a a, a door that the data must get through before it can get to the rest of the network or get to the resources on the other side. Most IPSs allow you to set them up in audit mode. When you set it up in audit mode, and that's it, the IPS will actually report and log everything that it sees and thinks that is bad behavior. Or it may even miss something that was bad behavior uh, that you threw at it and, needs, and that needs to be addressed. You should always put your IPS in audit mode long enough until you believe that switching it over to... Uh, prevention mode is going to not adversely affect, affect your business too much. And even after you flip it over to protection mode or active mode, it is going to require some additional tuning to make sure that you deal with any issues that users are reporting. One, one issue that users may report is a performance hit. That's why it's very important to buy the to right size your IPS. Make sure it's going to handle the traffic appropriately. Make sure you don't have too many rules in it. Um, if you're going to, if you need a lot of rules to cover all the systems on your network, then what you might want to do is to place general rules on your on your on your uh, main, your primary IPS at the perimeter, and then implement firewalls with IPS or 
fire IPS behind gateway firewalls into segments that further restrict the data and that way the IPS's will not get bogged down remember the more you throw at the inspection engine including rules and packets the slower the inspection engine will be will be able to handle those and the bigger the performance hit for your users intrusion detection systems are not placed in line they are their information is mirrored to them it also detects anomalous packets and network behavior but unlike IPS we don't use it to block traffic you can many IDS devices allow you to reconfigure a firewall or a switch but that's not recommended practice you can actually bring your network down when you don't want to or an attacker could uh, reconfigure your network uh, automatically based on your rules by taking advantage of the rules that you place in your IDS what it does do is alert on administrator defined rules IDS's still have a place in a network they're less expensive than IPS so that so they can be placed in locations that are less sensitive where data doesn't necessarily have to be blocked but you or traffic doesn't have to be blocked but you want to know about anything out of the ordinary and like IPS tuning is required so here is an IPS IDS example um, at the perimeter we have uh, a demilitarized zone or DMZ also we've looked we've called these uh, a, a outward facing security zone and you notice that between the two firewalls we have a network intrusion prevention system or NIPS this is uh, designed to monitor all traffic coming into a data center and preventing anything that that is anomalous or that we've plain just said that we want to block as it comes into the internal network segment B is a restricted network segment and we also put a network IPS on that as a gateway into that segment um, what you're probably going to see most often is a firewall with an integrated IPS sitting in that location so that uh, you can block all traffic and only scan traffic that is ostensibly allowed to get into the segment next we go to business continuity planning business continuity planning um, enables a quick response to events that interrupt business processes it allows us to bring processes back up before they exceed maximum tolerable downtime maximum tolerable downtime as you may remember from a previous lecture is the point is the amount of time that a process can be down before the business suffers irreparable damage a business continuity event is any condition or set of conditions that interrupts a business process or a set of processes and one of the things to take away from this is that most process business processes do not operate in isolation they either receive information from other processes to to produce an outcome or they may receive information from other processes and produce output for another process which produces outcomes the, and there's many different combinations of this so when a business process goes down it can affect multiple processes the other processes haven't gone down but they're not receiving the information or they're unable to provide information to continue um, or to uh, execute other processes that need to run or to produce additional outcomes other than the outcomes produced by the affected process so whenever you're looking at business continuity planning and you're looking at um, business impact it's important to look at all affected processes uh, when you're planning to recover an existing a the target process so your maximum tolerable downtime is not just based on how long it takes to get that process back up but it 
but how long can the other processes be without what they need before the business experiences an irreparable damage? Disaster recovery is a subset of business continuity. It, it deals with catastrophic business continuity events. And this brings us to planning. You know, we can't plan for every single business continuity event. There are too many, there are too many variations. So I always recommend that you plan for worst case scenarios. Build yourself a good solid disaster recovery plan. Make sure that the teams practice it so that when a, a less catastrophic event occurs, it's easy to adapt the disaster recovery operations to that minor business continuity event and respond quickly. This also includes um, incident response process. Part of business continuity is ensuring that you back up your data. It's necessary for disaster recovery because in many cases uh, the original data is gone. There are three types of backups, full, incremental, and differential. Full is everything is backed up. Uh, that's usually done like once a week in a time when it's not going to have a performance impact on business operation. Incremental backs up everything that changed since the last backup of any kind, whether it's full, incremental, or differential. Um, the, the, and a differential backup backs up everything that changed since the last full backup. The incremental backup doesn't take as long, and if you have a lot of stuff to back up and you have very small backup windows, in other words, you have a very small period of time where a backup will not affect business operation, then incremental may be the right choice. The downside for incremental is that it takes longer to restore your data because you have to restore the full backup and then all incrementals that were performed after the full. So if you're, you do a full backup on a Sunday and you have a, a failure on Saturday, you have to restore your full backup and the incrementals from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So it can take longer to get back up, but it takes less time to uh, copy the data. A differential is, is pretty much the opposite. Um, over time, it, it, as each day progresses, as each backup progresses from the full, the backups take longer because it's backing up everything that changed since the last full backup. It does reduce the amount of data that's backed up because it's only backing up what changes. But if you have a very limited window in which you can do backups, this might not be the right approach. However, if you need to be able to restore your data quickly and you don't want to do a full backup every single every day then the, the differential is your best choice because if something happens on a Saturday as on our previous example you restore the full backup and then the differential from Friday and you're up and running it's a it's a huge difference and between the incremental and differential depends on what your uh, objectives are, whether you want a quick restore or a quick backup, as to whether you're going to use an incremental or differential. Uh, very few businesses do a full backup, and very few large businesses will do a full backup every night. There just isn't the window for it. Uh, in the last organization I worked, the full backup could take 8 to 10 hours and was done uh, starting very early on a Sunday and into, uh, into Sunday morning or and late Sunday morning. Those are, and it would suck up network bandwidth. So it's important to make sure that you're doing backups within the, an acceptable window and uh, with an eye on maximum tolerable downtime. You also need to store backups off site. So traditionally we've backed up the tape, and tapes were taken off site and uh, usually you can put them into a, a hardened facility, facility like Iron Mountain and that uh, isn't you know or you can send it you can you could store it in a environmentally controlled facility that's secured 
and the rule of thumb is that the facility should be about 25 miles a minimum of 25 miles from your data center the reason for that is in case uh, of a, um, a catastrophic event 25 miles is considered a far enough radius for due diligence to be able to get your data back tapes are problematic um, in many cases I've been unable to restore backups from tape and it's they're very slow so one things that are are starting to take have have taken off um, in a big way for backups are disk backups cloud and co-locations a disk backup uses a specially designed solution that instead of sending the data to tape it simply sends it to disk disk is less expensive but again you still have a backup that uh, is on site and somehow you have to get it off site unless your disk backup system is at a co-location or in the cloud which brings us to cloud backups cloud backups are very good for small business uh, I use it for my wife's business I use it in my home office and uh, all my data is backed up about once an hour all my changes are backed up about once an hour and I have access to those file by file uh, there are enterprise solutions that will also provide that uh, just make sure that if you're using the cloud for backup that you have access to it in the event of a that you have to go to a hot site that you have to rebuild your network after a uh, after a catastrophic event the other thing is a co-location a co-location is a copy of your data center it doesn't have to have everything in it they might just have your critical systems and those systems are given data usually in many cases they're they're the changes to databases are journaled and those journals are sent over or other methods are used to trickle the data across a link to the co-location so the way you set up a co-location is you set up your critical applications you set up your database servers for those critical applications and then you over over the course of the day you're moving small amounts of information over to the co-location to update the data at that location if you lose your primary data center it takes a very short period of time to come bring your processes back up at the co-location so these are various different ways of protecting your information the other, and one thing that's not on here, and one, or one thing that is on here, and we didn't talk about, is the cloud. Um, companies are also increasingly putting their sensitive or their critical systems in the cloud. Um, that's another topic altogether about cloud security. But we should not be afraid to put systems in the cloud when it makes sense. It's a matter of extending our trust assessments, our risk assessments, to cloud service providers. And ensuring that they're doing the right thing to protect our data it makes sense for the business in many cases it's less ex it's not always less expensive but if you have a if you have processes that absolutely cannot go down sometimes a a uh, a cloud service provider is going to be able to provide more uptime than you can efficiently do yourself so in the past three weeks we've talked about risk a lot I wanted to spend some time today talking about aggregate risk aggregate risk is the amount of risk left over after you implement all of your controls so in this diagram we have probable threats which we've talked about remember we only look at threats that are probable in in our particular situation we have in this case we have controls that are that are applied to uh, patching configuration of systems passwords user behavior and firewalls 
in this example, it looks like the users have missed their security patches. They have weak security configurations. They haven't been running, for example, Microsoft Baseline Security Analyzer. They've got, they use weak passwords. They're probably not training their users. And instead of having uh, blocking all traffic and then only allowing what's necessary to flow through a firewall, they've left their firewall wide open, which is not unusual for many businesses. So probability of occurrence is a combination of your probable threats and your control set. Business impact then is your sensitivity or value of the data, whether or not it can be accessed by unauthorized personnel and your response posture. Even if an attacker gets through, and they will eventually, no matter how much you work at your controls, because you can't lock everything down 100%, they're going to get in, so incident response is absolutely necessary. The effectiveness of your response directly impacts business impact. So when you put all of this together, you have aggregate risk. Aggregate risk is adjusted by adjusting your controls and by adjusting your response posture. Probable threats will also affect your aggregate risk as new threats emerge or threats change. And threats are always changing and new threats are always emerging. Many different things, many different variables affect aggregate risk. So it's important when we're doing risk assessments, it's important when we're talking about security to understand these variables and to address all of them, not just to focus on one or two. And of course, but I'm not going to say it again, all I'm going to say is I hope you have a good week. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask.